Okay, so here's the deal. According to the popular mainstream science of today, we've been taught that dinosaurs existed and died millions of years before man ever came around. Now, once man made it onto the scene, we come all the way to the 1800s before dinosaur bones are finally discovered. They dug them up, they put them together, and in 1841, decided to call them dinosaurs. Now, if dinosaurs never really existed, then they were just an invention in the minds of men from only 200 years ago. So that's why in order to examine this topic, we have to go back further than just 200 years. And that's where it gets interesting. Because what happens if we not only find evidence that dinosaurs existed over 200 years ago, but what if we also find evidence that over 200 years ago, people already knew about dinosaurs? How would they know such a thing? And what are the implications? So in this video, we're gonna take a look at three basic reasons why I personally believe that dinosaurs really did exist. And I can sum up all three of those things with one word, history. And so history breaks down into the three categories. We have number one, historical depictions, number two, historical accounts, and number three, the Bible, which is technically also a historical account. But this is my list. I can use as many numbers as I want. Number one, historical depictions. This is an Egyptian palette that dates back to the reign of King Narmer, otherwise known as King Narmer's palette. Very creative. And King Narmer is believed to have been the first king to unify the upper and lower kingdoms of Egypt several thousand years ago. This is deemed as one of the most important artifacts from the dawn of Egyptian civilization. And the depictions on it are believed to commemorate King Narmer's conquest in joining these two kingdoms together. So you'll see on the one side, King Narmer is shown wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt, and on the flip side, he's wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt. You'll also notice on the flip side, a couple of animals that in this caption are referred to as mythical, which is interesting when you consider that the other animals depicted on the palette are real, but then the two that are being wrangled by two completely normal humans are somehow fake. And it's big body, long tail, and extremely long neck look suspiciously like what we know today as a sauropod. Now, in the same excavation that found this pallet, they also found this one. It's known as the two dog pallet. And I'm guessing they call it that because of this guy who looks more like a hyena, really. And then this guy who looks slightly headless. And again, you can see on this pallet a lot of perfectly ordinary looking animals. And then these guys with incredibly long necks. So are those also mythical? Because I'm thinking that if you live in Egypt and you wanted to pick some sort of long neck creatures, wouldn't giraffes be a little closer to home? Why you gotta be making things that look like dinosaurs? Okay, let's check out Cambodia where we find the Ta Prom Temple. And I'm sure I pronounced that completely wrong. But if you're a moviegoer and this place looks familiar, that's because this temple was featured in Laura Croft Tomb Raider back in 2001. It was built back in the 12th century and is believed to have been used originally as a Buddhist monastery and university. And there's one particular spot of this temple where there's a carving that doesn't look remarkably unlike a bit of a stegosaurus. And that's kind of weird from the 12th century. And what about China? What's going on with their zodiac? They've got rabbits, roosters, monkeys, horses, goats. Hey, babe, what's your sign? Dog. All right, all right. Oh, me? Pfft, I'm a pig. So they've got all these normal animals, and then right in the middle of that, there's a dragon. So 11 real animals, and then one fake one that just so happens to have a big body, long tail, and a long neck. I don't know. Seems a little curious, right? If you're going to have at least one fake animal, why not several? Why not a jackalope, a chupacabra, a yeti? And what about England, near the border of Scotland, at the Carlisle Cathedral? Under the floor of the choir is an interesting little tomb belonging to one Bishop Bell. He was buried there at the end of the 15th century, and they typically leave it covered to help protect it from foot traffic, because it's old. But under that covering, there's an outer brass border of the tomb. You'll see quite a few different animals depicted. You'll see a dog, you'll see a bat, you'll see a bird, a fish, an eel, a bear, but then you'll also see this carved on a grave in the 15th century. Now that's only four very brief examples of historical depictions found throughout the entire world. If you want to see more evidence like this on pottery, cave walls, rocks, figurines, statues, city gates, whatever, you should definitely pick up this book, 
Dire Dragons. It's from the Untold Secrets of Planet Earth series, and it is very, very eye-opening. And now that brings me to the second reason why I believe that dinosaurs actually did exist. Number one was historical depictions. Number two, historical accounts. In 326 BC, Alexander the Great reported that when he was conquering parts of what is now India, his soldiers were scared of the huge dragons that lived in caves there. And what about Marco Polo in the 13th century? When he returned to Italy from Asia, he reported of families who would raise dragons and have them pull royal chariots and parades and other special occasions. And they would also use dragon parts for medicinal purposes. The popular historian Josephus told of small flying reptiles in ancient Egypt and Arabia and described how their predator, the ibis, once stopped them from being able to invade Egypt. And then the Greek researcher Herodotus also tells of these flying reptiles in Arabia. And this dude is known as the father of history. So he's got a pretty high reputation. And he said that he saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to describe. The form of the serpent is like that of the water snake, but he has wings without feathers and as like as possible to the wings of a bat. He later goes on to describe their size, coloration, and reproduction. He even reports that venomous flying serpents were infamous for living in frankincense trees, so that when workers wanted to gather the tree's incense, they would have to employ putrid smoke to drive the flying serpents away. He says they very much resembled those which the Greeks and Latins called hydra. Now remember, flying reptiles aren't technically classified as dinosaurs. However, popular mainstream science does teach that they too died out millions of years before man came along. Yet, here they are for the father of history to tell us about. So are we supposed to rely on the accounts of these well-respected historians? Yet somehow when they talk about things like dragons or flying reptiles, we just ignore that? History is rife with encounters of dinosaur-like creatures. There's the legend of St. George slaying a dragon. There's the account of Beowulf. Even the atheistic astronomer Carl Sagan once remarked, the pervasiveness of dragon myths in the folk legends of many cultures is probably no accident. And that's something that Carl Sagan said that I can actually agree with. Now, if you want to study more about historic encounters with dinosaurs, aka dragons, a good place to start is genesispark.com. From there, you can find all sorts of other resources and fun things to check out. So go for it. Now remember, the popular mainstream science of today tells us that dinosaurs died out millions of years before man ever came onto the scene. And mankind never knew that dinosaurs existed until they started digging them up in the 1800s. So if that's true, then nobody living before the 1800s should know that there ever was any such thing as a dinosaur. But if we do find evidence to the contrary, what implications does that have on our modern ideas of mainstream science? And the question you really have to ask yourself is this. Do you really want to know? And now this brings me to reason number three as to why I believe that dinosaurs really did exist. And of course, this is the most important one, the Bible. Now, when we consider a question like, are dinosaurs in the Bible? We have to remember that the first English Bibles were translated back in the 1600s. And that was about 200 years before the word dinosaur ever existed. So if you're reading your King James English, you won't find the word dinosaur in there. Why? Because it simply did not exist yet. But what about modern English translations of the Bible? Why don't they use the word dinosaur? Well, they could if they wanted to, but we have to remember that the people making those translations already believe what they've been taught by the popular mainstream science of the day, that dinosaurs died out millions of years before man ever came into existence, just like what we've been taught. So when they're making the translations, they're not looking for dinosaurs to be there, so they completely miss it. So let me invite you to think critically about this for a second. Are skunks in the Bible? Are anteaters in the Bible? Killer whales? The duck-billed platypus? A squirrel. Just because an animal isn't listed by name in the Bible doesn't mean that it never existed. Now, one thing we know for sure, though, is that all of the birds and all the fish are created on day five, and all the land-dwelling animals, day six. That's what the very first chapter of the Bible tells us. And we know that dinosaurs are land-dwelling creatures. That's one of their defining features. So any dinosaur-ish creatures that are in the water those aren't dinosaurs. Those are marine reptiles. And any dinosaur-ish creatures that are in the air, 
Those aren't dinosaurs either, those are flying reptiles. So we've got marine reptiles in the water, we've got flying reptiles in the air, both created on day five. But the land-dwelling creatures, like the dinosaur, day six. Now remember, if the popular mainstream science of today is correct, then that means there won't be any historical depictions or historical accounts that predate the 1800s. And there's certainly not going to be any biblical accounts of dinosaur-like creatures. But if the Bible does record dinosaur-like creatures, and the historical evidence does show historical depictions and accounts that predate the 1800s, then that means that the Bible is in agreement with the evidence. And it also means that the popular mainstream science of today is not. So please, think about that. Not counting the book of Revelation, there are over 20 dragon references in your King James English. And according to the context, it treats it like a real animal. Let me show you a few examples. Oh, but don't forget about Revelation, because in a minute I'm going to come back around to that and show you why that's exciting. There's Deuteronomy 32. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. An asp is a real animal that has real venom. So by comparison, shouldn't the dragon be a real animal that has real poison? It was Isaiah 34. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be a habitation of dragons and a court for owls. Well, again, owls are real. There's Jeremiah 9. And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons, and I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. And Jeremiah 51. The king of Babylon has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me up like a dragon. He has filled his belly with my delicates. He has cast me out. Sounds like dragons are pretty big creatures that are fully capable of swallowing up humans. These verses are definitely using dragon references as if they're real animals. And then you get to the book of Job, chapter 40, and you'll find a very unusual animal by the name of Behemoth. Now, most animals mentioned in the Bible aren't described. The Bible just calls it by name and then you move on. But this particular animal, the behemoth, has a very detailed description. And his description is given to Job, but it's from God himself. This is God speaking directly to Job. He says, behold, behemoth. In other words, hey, Job, consider this guy for a second. Check out the behemoth which I made with you. With you. Well, we all know that Job is a human being. So he was born from his mom, right? Job wasn't created from the dust of the ground. But Adam was. And when was Adam created? Day six. And when were all the land-dwelling animals created? Day six. So behold now behemoth which I made with you. In other words, Check out this big old creature that I made at the same time as I made mankind. Behold now, behemoth, which I made with you. He eats grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lies under the shady trees in the covert of the reeds and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinks up a river and hastes not. He trusts that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He takes it with his eyes. His nose pierces through snares. So he's a big dude who eats grass. So that's a relief. And he moves his tail like a cedar. Now, you may have some cedar trees in your neighborhood that aren't all that impressive, but, but we're talking about the biblical cedar here, as in the cedars of Lebanon. And those aren't tiny. And some people will try to make the argument here that the tail merely moves like a cedar. Therefore, it's more of a description of how the tail moves, not really a description of what the tail looks like. And that's fair enough. I can agree with that. But in my estimation, it does make sense that a tail that most resembles a cedar tree is going to have the same movement capabilities as a cedar tree. 
but they want to say that a branch or even a twig of a cedar tree flows in the breeze back and forth in much the same way as an elephant's tail. And that's true, it does. And so by using that interpretation, you could say that an elephant eats grass. He has a big, strong body. He hangs out under the shady trees. He can put away a lot of water. You could even say that his nose pierces through snares. So that could be true whether you're talking about the trunk or even the tusks. I mean, those are two different ways of piercing, so that kind of makes sense. But the biggest critique I have of that is that if the behemoth is actually an elephant, it just seems to me that God would have said something about his ears, right? But if you do know what a sauropod dinosaur looks like, it's hard not to admit that this sounds like a pretty good description of it. And that is 10 whole verses dedicated to the description of behemoth. But then God goes on for the entire following chapter of Job 41 to talk about a water creature named Leviathan. And that is a hugely fierce animal that even Isaiah has something to say about. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So now we have a dragon that lives in the sea. And that's another reason for me not to surf. And now this finally brings us back to the book of Revelation. In that book, there's no fewer than 12 verses that use the word dragon. And those 12 verses are used in a very symbolic way, which is very specifically different from how they're used throughout the rest of Scripture. So in each one of these instances in Revelation, the word dragon is used as a description of Satan. And here's where the rubber meets the road, because Satan is a very real adversary. He is the ultimate bad guy throughout the history of all creation. And so if the biblical dragon is not a real creature, then God is comparing the quite formidable enemy of our souls to a mythical creature that doesn't really exist. And so therefore the comparison holds no real meaning. But if the biblical dragon is a real creature, well, now you've got something very sobering to consider. So the bottom line is, if dinosaurs never really existed, and they were just made up 200 years ago to help fool the masses. Well then, number one, dinosaur depictions that predate the 1800s should not exist. Number two, dinosaur encounters and descriptions that predate the 1800s should also not exist. And number three, biblical records of dragons and dinosaur-like creatures that definitely predate the 1800s should not exist. But in all three cases, it seems that they do. And therefore, I personally, have no choice but to conclude that dinosaurs really did exist. And keep in mind, I haven't even bothered to mention the fossil record. And so if all of this is true, and the popular mainstream science of today keeps telling us that dinosaurs died out millions of years ago, and that no man has ever seen a living dinosaur, well then perhaps the lie isn't that dinosaurs are real, but instead the lie is about what they're telling us about the existence of dinosaurs. And if that's the case, then maybe we'd better rethink who is telling us these things and why they're doing it. Because what we've learned today is not only that dinosaurs are real, but that they've lived together with man all throughout history. And the Bible is in agreement with that. And those who purport to be well-educated scientists of the day, those who are usually government funded and approved, have their own television shows and broadcasts, are given prominent seats and recognition and guest spots on popular talk shows and forums, and reap many riches with their fame and notoriety, those guys are not in agreement with the evidence. So what's up with that? Is it possible that Paul actually knew what he was talking about when he wrote to Timothy? Keep that which is committed to your trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. I'm just saying, I'm Daniel, and that is the writing on the wall.